Welcome back. Welcome back. Let's talk Tuesday. I'm Kurt Scher. This is The Net, and we are with Broken for Better Ministries. Tonight's topic, we're going to talk about when scars remain. When scars remain. We have said from the beginning of this journey that D and I just wanted to do our best to be authentic and real in this journey. We wanted to walk through our own healing. We wanted to walk through our own grief. We want to walk through our own marriage things so that we could come alongside others that potentially are just walking out of that. They're walking in it right now or something is coming up tomorrow that they have no idea about. All we hope to do is just give tools and equip because we may be just a little further down the journey than someone else. Or God has shown us and revealed some things to us that has helped us and we just want to be as authentic and as transparent as we can through that. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that we shouldn't grieve as the world grieves, as those that have no hope. It does not say we won't grieve. And I think for a lot of people, what we're seeing is a lot of people, a couple things happen. They get hung up in that grief, right? And they just, it's like quicksand. They really can't find their way out of it. They battle and they battle. And even for ourselves, like there's days that that's tough, right? That we get hung up in that grief and it's hard to battle through that. But when you talk about days or months or potentially years of doing that, it creates a real, um, just, it just tears you down. Um, we're doing our best to grieve well. Some days we have great days and some days we don't have such great days. Um, but we want to make sure we're keeping our eyes on the truth. We're keeping our eyes focused where they need to so that we can stand tall and face another day. Um, this is hope that we have, that we've gained, and it doesn't come from the world. I'm going to be honest with you because there's a lot of things that uh, in the world today that could detract from our hope, could distract where we're at. And going through this that we're going through, man, all that stuff of the world truly doesn't matter. We find ourselves just grinding in God's word, and that gives us the strength and the wisdom and the truth to be able to move forward. So, then, it, you know, when we have the topic here, uh, when scars remain, tell me a little bit, why did you decide on that name for this week's topic? Well, first off, I want to touch on something real quick that you just said. You said some days we're grieving well, others not so well. I, th- I think... Like that's even that thought process to me is like it's hard to swallow because just because you have a really, really hard day and I think someone needs to hear this because I've needed to hear this. It doesn't mean you're not grieving well. It means you're really having a bad day. And sometimes even when you're having a really, really bad day, it doesn't mean that it's not well. It just means that you're really struggling that day and you, you're still pressing, even if it's even if it's heavy, even if you're in a dark place. It doesn't mean that you're not doing it well. It just means that you're being authentic with how you're feeling. But how you process mm. that is very, very important. And I just I just felt like I needed to say that because I, at times, feel like upset with myself because I'm so down or I'm so dark. But that's allowed. That's allowed on, on days that you're really, really dark. Right? Yeah, that's and that's a very real thing because I bet you a lot of people have heard, even we potentially have heard, Um, that people think, you know, when they're not doing well, when you have a bad day and man, it's taken them so long to get out of this and wow, this should have been moved. Yeah. Are you healed yet? That's what, like that question comes so much. And, uh, I think people put this timeline on when it should happen and when it shouldn't. And that's just not reality. That's not true for some people. They're able to compartmentalize. They're able to move forward a little bit quicker, right? They're able to do that. For that okay that they're still dealing with their grief right. they've just dealt with it a different way and they're able to move forward a little bit quicker but dealing with it you're right i don't I, that that term dealing well or not dealing well it's kind of a heavy thing that's a topic in itself honestly yeah, yeah. we'll do that another time <laughs> but yeah last week you know it was a much lighter topic talking about or not last week but last episode was you know talking about love languages and um it was actually kind of nice just to have a a, a lighter topic and this week is just really heavy, and I really feel like it's because God asked us or asked me specifically to broach the subject um, when scars remain. And speaking of hard days, uh, I was having uh, this has been a hard week for me. It's been a very extremely hard week, if I'm honest. And um, I don't even really know why days come, but last week I was processing in the middle of night and just kind of having it out with God and like. Um, asking him, you know, when, when will I ever feel whole again? Or will I feel whole again? 
when will joy come that's not immediately encompassed with hmm. but, you know? Um, and probably the clearest I've heard the Lord since the accident and the clearest um, vision I've gotten from the Lord, um, I just felt like he showed me his scars. And in, the, in that moment, I felt like Holy Spirit was saying to me, well, I kept my scars. What if I choose to not heal you of yours? Or what if yours remain? And at first, I did not like that picture. <laughs> I didn't like that <laughs> response. But uh, it really it really just set in my, like a, a piece after a moment, kind of just took over. And I don't think I've ever really realized that you know, we sing the songs, Worthy is the God with Scars, and we see artwork with pictures of, you know, his scars and all of those things. But I don't think that I ever consciously put two and two together that he was the God that healed on the daily. He rose himself from the dead, and yet he chose to keep his scars. Yeah. And I was immediately taken back by that because I was like, I don't think I've ever really thought through that process. Like, why did he choose to keep his scars? And the easy answer is, well, he wanted to prove who he was so he could show his hands and he could show his feet. But that's that doesn't really make sense because he was walking through walls. I mean, he was appearing before his disciples. This God that had they had seen <laughs> be taken off the cross and brutally murdered, they were able to physically see him. So that wasn't necessary. You know, so it was like this process of why? Like why did you keep your scars? And the scars tell a story. Right? And I think so often we just want God to remove it. We don't want to be reminded of the things that hurt. We just want to feel better again. We just want to feel whole again. We just want to be healed. We want all of these things. But sometimes he says, I want to keep those scars. I want them to remain because they show and they tell a story. Hmm. You know, he, he healed the lame and he healed the blind and he did all of those things. But he chose to keep those scars. Listen. You know, when we use the phrase, that scarred me for life. Have you ever had a moment that you still walk with that scar today? Like, and, and I think immediately we could think physical, right? But I love the way that you're doing it. I love the, the track where God has you on this to just to go, man, what is that scar and why is it here? And, and what is that to remind me of? Or what does that look like? Or man, where is God leading me through that scar and, and all of that? Because honestly, this is a scar that as much as we don't want the pain, I don't know that we ever want the scar to leave either, right? Like we don't ever want to just forget about Logan and move on. That's not going to happen. So the scar is like there forever. Do you, do you think you have, like, before this moment, is there a time that you had a scar that, that was potentially teaching you or leading you somewhere or guiding you into something that you can remember? Yeah, for sure. Before I touch on that, though, I, you know, in hearing you say that, when I think of Jesus as scars, I, I don't think that I ever want, like, a total healing to where I forget, right, the scar or whatever. But, I, you know, the scars that Jesus bear in his hands and his feet those weren't given to him by his father those were given to him by Rome like those were a picture of sin those were a picture of shame yeah. those were a picture of loss and so you know I think when I ask God for wholeness and I ask God for healing it's because I want all the things that I want the Holy Father to give me right and I just expect him or I desire him and I want him to take away the things of the world the things that hurt the things that remind me the things that and so you know, I think that's kind of the, the, the picture when I get there. But, you know, when I was um, like 12 years old, I had knee surgery. I was sliding in a second base and heard a pop. And next thing I know, I'm in the doctor's office. And my mom's, you know, they're with me. And the doctor's telling me that I got to have surgery. And I was going to be down all summer. And I wasn't going to be able to play ball. And I wasn't going to be able to cheer. And I had just made the middle school cheerleading team. And I remember being devastated, right? That was my whole world, you know, <laughs> like I'll never be able to play, whatever. And, um, you know, it really, it really bothered me and it really affected, like I was embarrassed by it. Like it was this big, bright red scar that was right on my knee. And, you know, anytime hmm. I wear my cheerleading skirt or my shorts or whatever, people would draw attention to it. And I would try to act like it didn't hurt. 
I would try to act like it didn't bother me, even though it, like, it really hurt more than I even let on. But I was so, like, bullheaded that I was going to, like, play ball that I just pretended, like, you know, it didn't hurt. But it was, it was still a part of me. Even as it began to heal and even as people, you know, asked, you know, questions about it, it was something I could not get rid of it. And it was a story that was now part of my story hmm. that I'll never be able to change. Um, and I know that God uses, you know, part of our story as a couple and what we've walked through in our marriage to heal other marriages. And those scars hurt, you know. But over time, those scars have gotten lighter. Like, the, you, you know, they, they're there. They're part of your story. But you're no longer embarrassed. Hmm by them they're so they're no no longer as raw or as painful because time you know you know this old saying time heals all wounds and I think with this scenario that we're walking through or maybe the scenario you're walking through whether it's loss of job loss of spouse loss of you know marriage um, loss of your ideals I think to hear time heals all wounds it just feels like nasty in your mouth like it doesn't even for sure it just even when you said it I was just like ugh yeah (laughs) But I think that not only was he telling me that, yeah, this is part of your story, and yeah, it'll eventually not hurt as much, I think in him revealing those scars, he was also saying not all miracles are for on this side of heaven. Not all miracles happen here. Some of them Hmm. happen in eternity. And I think that we can get so caught up on our stories, right? Because for me, I'm like, well, it's a scar and it's a story and how can I use it? Even us sitting here sharing our story with you, like we want it to be impactful. We want to walk through authentically how we're grieving and how yeah. we're processing. But even that can taste sick on our tongue as we talk about it because you you can't explain the gravity of what you're walking through um, without the pain, right? Without the realness. But to be able to just perceive that, man, sometimes the healing and the miracle isn't on this side of heaven, that is hope for us. That's that you said at the beginning. We grieve as if, you know, we can't grieve as if there's no hope. We have to grieve differently because our true our true focus has to remain on the hope. It has to remain on the hope that yes, life is gonna leave us scars, it's gonna leave hurts, it's gonna leave some unhealed, it's gonna leave some things broken. But I have I have to remember that, that full healing cannot can be in the future and not here, if that makes sense. Yeah. And now full healing will only be in the future. I, you yeah, know, we'll find, um, for sure. you know, you talk about miracles and, and it's an interesting topic when it comes to, um, heart and pain and, and marriage things. Um, we've obviously seen miracles. We've experienced miracles. We've been a part of miracles. We've seen miracles in our own family. Um, but that word miracles, I, I think sometimes because we know he is the God of miracles, mm-hmm. it's this expectation and this belief that it just is always going to happen. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's the God of miracles. Great. I've watched you turn water into wine. Wonderful. Now, okay, now I need mine. Like, yeah. and I'm not asking for water into wine. I'm asking for far greater. I need far more. Um, what happens, like, kind of walk me through, because obviously there's been times in your life, and, and I love the fact that we just get to talk like this. We haven't even gone over these together. Um, and so kind of walk me through a little bit, like, in your own life. What happens when you cry out for a miracle and he doesn't heal? Or you cry out for a miracle and it doesn't come to be? Uh, you know, we've here recently that's kind of been our story right like that that night there was a lot of crying out for god to show up and and he didn't and what we would perceive what we would have wanted of what yeah right what our answer would have been right. um but, so kind of kind of walk me a little bit through this what happens kind of for the person like given encouragement or or How do you process out when you're going through it and you're there and you're asking and it's just not whatever you're asking, marriage, healing, safety, protection, finance, whatever that is, you just don't see him answer. Yeah, I think um, this week in crying out, I was really challenged by a book I'm reading called A Grace Disguised. And the guy, the author, um, he lost his, 
his wife, his mom, and his daughter all on the same accident. It's crazy. So, you know, you think like in our scenario, I think nothing could be worse, right? And like, I just, I can't imagine. But There's always, always, always a, something yeah. worse. But um, anyways, in that book, he said, you know, he had gotten in this routine, which is where I've been recently, if I'm being honest, just why me? Like, why did this happen? Mm-hmm. What did I do to deserve this? What did we do to deserve this? Why did we lose this? Why did we, why do we have to face this? Why is this our story? All of those questions. And he poses the question that a friend of his asked him. And he said, if you're brazen enough to ask the question, why me? You have to be brazen enough to ask, why not me? And that like, was like, first it was like a dagger in my heart. And then second, I was like, you know, why not me? Like, why did God choose to allow me to be born in a first world country? You know, when we've gone and done these mission trips, Logan was part of them. My other kids have been part of them, you know, to Haiti and Cuba and the Amazon and And, you know, you go and you visit these orphanages and that child was born there. I was born here. Why? Why? Why did I get that privilege? Why did I get the privilege of having a good education? Why did I get the privilege of having three amazing boys that I got to raise, that we have amazing memories with? And and why did I get to Hmm. work in ministry and be able to lead others, um, you know, the way that we've led people and God's allowed us to do that? Like, why? Like, why? Why that? And if I have to say why on one hand, I have, I have to be able to say why both. Like, why not me? Why, why did I deserve the first, but I don't deserve the, the latter? Why am I so good? What did I do? I didn't do anything to be born where I was born or to get the privilege that I've been given. I, I was, that was literally where I was placed. And so if that's the case, then why not me? Like, why, do, why am I so special that I shouldn't have to walk through the heartache, you know? I think literally you just said something like that is kind of just mind blowing to me and I'll have to break it down a little bit to me, you know, my own, but we, we never question the good things. We only question the bad. Yeah. And what, you know, the thing that's challenging me even in this moment right now is When you begin to go, why, if if you were to truly ask that question, why not me? Why, why wouldn't bad things, a terrible, like I wouldn't even want to ask it. Because I think when you ask that question, you then have to be ready for any scenario to be turned in a way that it's used for purpose. And that's so hard. Like, why would a bad thing not happen to me? Because if I'm walking in the Lord, I'm walking in power and strength and I understand where my help comes from and I understand who my comforter is. And so why would that not happen to me? Because I'm a child of his. And so now I must take this and I must use it. Like that's, that makes you look at everything in a way that honestly, like, I don't know that many of us want to look at it like that. It's, yeah. it's I like, you start asking that stuff and I feel like you open up this Pandora's box to more bad things because you're like in this place of like, you know, why not me? Let it happen to me. And that's never fun. But man, I've never, I've, I've, I've never even have thought to myself, why wasn't I born in a third world country? Yeah. Not born I think it, you know, that thought this week, really, it really crippled me. Like it really, really did. Because I think like there's this entitlement to our American Christian culture. There is, there's an entitlement that I think the selfish entitlement that comes with, you know, me being a believer. And this, this is what, you know, and, and I think that, God doesn't say that in his word. That's not the gospel. Like the gospel is literally riddled with people that walk through hard things and turn to Jesus. And so that's not the gospel Mm. that he portrays in in the Bible. And yet somehow we hold on to this. Now that is what other religions say about, you know, you do enough good and these things will happen to you. But that's not what the gospel says. In fact, in Matthew 5.45, it says, For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So what does that mean? It means for us to make much of any of it. Like we have to, yes, miracles are beautiful and they happen. And like you said, we've been able to witness some and be blown away by the glory of God and like see him do something that no one said could happen. But we have, especially in times that we're walking through, and I'm telling you, I'm preaching in my own heart because it's been a hard week (laughs) and I'm really trying to grasp this, but we have to hold on to not the miracles, but the cross. Like we have to know that the hope comes from the cross. 
not the miracles, because miracles are temporary. Miracles are, are temporary, and it's okay for us to ask for them, and it's okay for... He, he, he is capable of doing them, and like hmm. I said, we witness them, and it's okay. But if we base our faith solely on what He can do for us, our faith will be shaken. It truly will. Because the, the boy who was raised from the dead, he had to be put back in the grave again. Like, do you understand, like, that... Did, that story didn't end there. He had to meet his maker eventually. And so our promise has to come from the cross. Yeah, I, you know, it's that clinging thing that I think I've probably thought about more than anything over the last few months and how so many people, um, when going through a hard situation or when going through a hard period when things don't look like they have any hope to them and they're it's all dark and things will never change and you've always been and it's always been and it's never going to fix i think that's when people they cut ties right like it's easier just to leave and escape that problem versus pressing into the cross and what is god doing through this yeah it, it, you know, it's not a matter of what we can see and what we can't see. There, there's things happening in the spiritual realm that we may never see, you know. Yeah. And here you and I are, we're looking at a problem that it's never going away. So would it be easy for us to try to mask it and cope and leave it and not face reality and let's just, you know, pretend like these blinders are on and we never look at anything? Yeah, we could do that. In some days we try. I think. But, but what good does it help us? Yeah. You know what I mean? I think when, when you look at and you take this into relational problems, right, parents and children and, and, um, and that kind of sort, you, you're left with options of, I can leave because the grass is greener. Yeah. Well, what happens when there is no choice to leave? Like, even if, I, even if we were like, you know what, it's too hard, let's leave. Then we both go our separate ways with our own hurt. Right, yeah. And I think that's what my how many times what happens in marriages we think the escape is let me just leave this problem okay now i've masked the pain that's no longer right in front of me well all you've done is you've taken more pain and more baggage into whatever next season you have and so i love the fact that you're saying listen you've got to press in you're in that thing and that marriage looks like it's not going to work press into the cross don't cut bait and run press in that child's wayward and making terrible decisions Press into the cross. You can't take that hurt and that pain with you. You've got to be able to move in. So let me ask you this. How do you reconcile like when those prayers aren't answered um, or those disappointments and those, those shortcomings, they're just there. Like how do you, what do you deal with? How are you dealing with that? How personally are you even walking through it now? I feel like, because I know you and I have communicated um, about that. I feel like, man, man, God, like, did God answer our prayer? Why didn't God answer our prayer? Why didn't God protect our boys? Why didn't, like, there's a lot of that. So how do you, like, how are you processing in that moment um, with those questions and answers? I think um, just to be vulnerable and real, I'm probably one of the worst people to ask that question right now because I'm working out my own answers um, as a mom who just lost a son, right? But in the Word it says, and in Philippians 2.12, it says, In my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I think that someone today needs to hear that. And that's why I, I pray you understand why we're trying to be so real and vulnerable. Um, hmm. Because it's not fun, necessarily. Yeah. It's not fun. It's not like, woo, let's go, you know, let's go cry on camera. But I think someone else needs to understand that working out your faith, Working out your own salvation, working out your faith with fear and trembling and saying, God, I don't understand this moment. There is so much beauty in that. And we don't have to be fearful of that. We don't have to, you know, we don't have to be concerned that he can't handle that. And I think so often, you know, the easy answer is just have faith. You know, even when we talk about pressing the cross, what does that mean? It means trying to change your focus to what is actually in the future. What is reality? What happens at the cross? What happens in, on the other side of eternity like that's what actually actually matters so this last week um you know which was veterans day on friday and i was sitting at this little cafe i was having a really hard day and i was like i have to get out of the house so i took a book and went and sat on this porch and was reading this book on the porch and um the author of, of that book was talking about how different losses look different like some are expected it might be uh you know 
a terminal illness that happens over time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes lost in that way can almost feel like a relief of the pain or sometimes um, someone, you know, goes rock climbing or does something dangerous and people say, well, they took a risk when they did this or that. And then, you know, there's people that join, you know, the military and they put their lives on the line and, but then there's tragic loss that comes unexpected, which is what we're walking through. And Mm -hmm. some of you might be walking through something that just blindsided you and it was unexpected, but in reading about the different kinds of loss, it struck me that, you know, people that walk through loss, you know, in war or, or mil- in the military, um, and, and thinking back on Veterans Day, like I said, I'll, I'll get there in a second, my brain. Um, I was thinking about our boys and how for years I've prayed over them that God would make them warriors for the kingdom of God. And, you know, having three boys, I think a fear as a mom was like, oh, you know, all these wars are happening. What if they get drafted and what, you know, all these things, you know, and, um, you think I, that was a fear. I feel like that conversation happened. It's still happening. It's still happening. <laughs> um, I may throw out the like papers that come in the mail that say, you know, join. I was like, nope. Um, anyways, but I, I always was praying over our boys that God would make them warriors for the kingdom that like, yeah. that their lives would count. And looking back with, what we're walking through right now with our son, like we know that he fought the good fight. And I really fully believe that God made good on that promise, that God made good on that prayer. But I don't think that in my, you know, again, I'll say it, my American ideal church culture heart, I don't think that I believe that prayer would cost a casualty, that it would be a casualty of war there. That a God that's good I didn't believe would make good on that promise by taking his son home. And that's what I'm kind of trying, just trying to, you know, answered prayers sometimes look different in all forms. But I think what's hard is trying, going back to your question, I know I took a long circle to get there, but I think answered prayer for us, we want it to be done in our way, right? But sometimes God answers prayers and they're answered. They're just not how we would have ever ever written the story you know we would have never written the story that way but if God answers prayers different than our name it and claim it ideals is he still good is he still good is he still good even if the healing and the wholeness comes on the other side of heaven is he still good if he does things different than my way is he only God if he does something that doesn't cause any type of suffering and I think that's where we have to really kind of, you know, land the plane and say, what kind of God do we believe in? Is he capable of making good on his promises that don't look like what we thought they would look like? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, uh, that is truly where we're at. (laughs) You know, it's the message that I think God gave me years ago that he really pulled back out in June to refine in a certain way of how to how do we view God? And right now with, with where you're at and what, whatever you may be walking through or whatever you're about to walk into, um, you have to solidify that view of God right now. Like you've got to determine that now, especially if you're in a good season of your life. And, you know, I, I think so many times we get on that mountaintop and God is good, man. We get money in the bank. Kids are doing great. We were there. Like that was us, you know, like we were, we were perfectly happy and life was great. Um, but it's, it's a lot harder, that view of God when you're in the valley. Um, but you still have to claim it. You know, you still got to stand it. And so I, we would just encourage you like, man, begin to plant those seeds in your heart now of how do you view God? And if there's things in your heart, like, you know, I think God is a little selfish or I think God is a little demanding. Like, you got to work that stuff out. you got to dig into God's Word. Seek counsel on that because those are the things that in your deepest, darkest moment, the enemy will begin to, to pull on those strings and pull on those things to where you begin to get this wrong view of God because you'd never established a right view when he was good. And so begin right now, even analyzing your own heart of where are some areas that I have with God that maybe me and God are a little like in contention, like we're in a little, I'm not, you know, I think, 
that one time he asked too much of me. He wanted too much from me. He demanded too much from me. And man, God, I, I got to work that out with you so that I can work out my salvation so that I can run my race well. I think that the, the scary thing there is when you decide God can't handle my questions and so you just pull away. I think that's the biggest um, challenge that I think anyone walking through loss or loss of expectations or loss in any way really, really struggles. Um, yeah. You know, God didn't provide what I wanted, so I just I'm pulled away instead of working out your faith. Uh, well, and, and even in our marriage, right, we've talked about communication before, and yeah. I'm not the guy to be like, hey, let's talk about it, <laughs> right? And you're always the one that goes, no, we're, we're going to talk about it. And so you pull that out of me. Well, I've entered a season of my life now to where if I took that same approach with God right now, I could compartmentalize hurt and pain and grief, but two and a half, three years, five years, 10 years from now, it'll come out. It'll come out. Yeah. I'll make some stupid rash decision, bad choices, doing horrific things because I never dealt with it right. when it was there. You know, I never dealt with it when it was first there. And so I right now I'm having a lot of open communication with God and a lot of very transparent and vulnerable conversations with God. Um, ones that probably honestly a year ago, I probably would have been a little... Like, oh, I can't talk to God like this. <laughs> but now I'm like, well, he knows what's in my heart and he knows how ticked off I am anyway. So I'm just going to be exactly the way it is. But then what I love is he's so good that like even through that, he takes it, takes it, takes it. And then shows me through his word or through somebody or through worship. He just shows me the truth and reality of who he is. And he speaks right to my what I brought to him all upset about in the first place. So we serve a good, good father. Babe, listen, I know that every time we do this, and you wrote this week, and so I know you had to get all up in your feelings and emotions, and I thank you for doing that. I thank you for being strong. For you that may be watching, I appreciate the time that, that you've spent with us. I pray this was beneficial, that there was some nugget of truth that you can pull out. Um, just know Broken for Better Ministries has a desire to see you thrive and flourish in the most healthy spiritual way, God-loving way that you possibly can. I feel like we should end in prayer today. Is that okay? Let's do it. I feel like, I just feel like, I don't know who's watching, but even if it's just for my own heart, I just feel like we should do pray. It. Um, God, I'll... I just thank you so much for how much you love us, God, in spite of us. God, that you didn't require anything of us to love us. Mm. God, you love us first. That's what your word says. Yes. It says you love us first, God. So, God, I just ask that whoever's watching this, whoever's dealing with any kind of loss, God, I just ask that you begin to do something fresh in their life and begin to give them an ounce of hope. God, I pray mm -hmm. over my own heart, over my own husband, God, but over those that are watching, God, that you give us a glimmer of hope and that you give us just a piece Amen. of who you are, God. Help us to hold fast to your truth. Help us to work out our own faith. Help us to not run from you, but run to you, God, even in things that we don't understand. Help us to see purpose. Help us to find um, the, the love and the passion that you have for yes. us, God. Help us to stand firm as we face many trials, God. Help us to stand firm. God, I pray for the families and the generations that come behind, God, all those that are watching. And I just ask, God, that you... Be with us, God. Help us be who you created us to be. Help us to see ourselves even when we don't. Help us to see ourselves as you see us, God. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.